Hello and welcome to the 2021 Veterans Florida Virtual Expo presented by Bank of America. This is the entrepreneurship panel about surviving and thriving during and after the pandemic and of course sustainability. I'm Amy Entris and I am the entrepreneurship development manager at Veterans Florida and I'm also a Navy veteran. My background is in program management in a few different industries, including government contracting, agriculture, and also I have personal experience as an entrepreneur. So we'll go ahead and get started with introductions. Rosie, would you please begin? Sure, thank you, Amy. I'm Rosie Lee. I am the co-founder and executive director of Action Zone, which is an entrepreneur support organization in Tampa serving the military community. community. And I am also the owner of the newly launched Notary Place, which is a notary services and notary education um, operation. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, John, if you'll go next, please. Okay, yeah, my name's uh, Dr. John Batchelor from the University of West Florida. I am the chair of the management department. It's now known as business administration department and the head of the Center for Entrepreneurship. And we work with veterans uh, from the, our area through a grant with Veterans Florida. And we're currently training our second cohort of veteran entrepreneurs. Wonderful, thank you. Tom? Oh, I'm Tom Rice, and I'm a member of the Veterans Florida Board of Directors. Uh, I serve at the pleasure of the Senate President. Uh, you know, when we were established, uh, I was honored to, to be brought on this board. I serve as the treasurer, so, you know, every time, you know, we have our budget time and uh, we've just been in the legislative session, uh, you know, those, those groups that were able to help with those funds that come in, uh, you know, we're able to help the universities and this program, uh, and we're just delighted to do it. Yes, thank you very much. Troy? Uh, again, I'm Troy Underwood, uh, owner of Tampa Steel and Supply, and we're a metal service center located in Ybor, Ybor City since uh, 1983. Uh, I purchased the company about three years ago after running it for four years for the former owner and uh, founder. He was an absentee owner. Uh, the business, we service about 4,000 customers from a variety of uh, sectors. And uh, in 2020, we were recognized by the Business Observer as a top 500 company in the Florida Gulf Coast. Uh, on a personal level, I, I grew up in a military family. Uh, my father is a retired colonel in the Army, and uh, both my grandparents served. My maternal grandfather was a, a major in the Army, and my, grand, my other grandfather was a tail gunner in World War II. And I graduated from the University of Florida on an ROTC scholarship and served in the Army Reserves for nine years. And uh, prior to purchasing TSS, my civilian career was really uh, a progression of sales operations and general management positions, uh, mostly in the building materials industry. And uh, I'm a firm believer of self-development and continuing education. And I want to thank Veterans Florida and Action Zone because uh, Veterans Florida sponsored me uh, for their entrepreneurship program at Action Zone, and that really helped me uh, grow and network, you know, within the, uh, the veteran community and helped me grow my business. So thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, great. Thank you all for being here today. Um, this is a very relevant topic. Um, we have all, we're all hanging in there. So it would be really great if you would all share some of your personal experiences with uh, how you have basically uh, navigated the last year plus uh, throughout the pandemic um, and adjusted your business practices. And uh, if you would just give us a little bit of insight into what changes you had to make and what you've learned from the process and some guidance on how to move forward. Uh, Grizzy, do you wanna start? Sure, sure. Well, as the um, executive director of Action Zone, we're a nonprofit. So of course, when the pandemic hit, the first concern was how do we facilitate everything we've been doing in person um, and still reach the veterans in our cohorts um, effectively. What we discovered in that realm is that it wasn't the media, it wasn't the location and the meeting space, it was the people. And so our transition to virtual classes was relatively seamless and the um, impact of the programs did not appear to be affected at all. Um, if anything, 
there were some enhancements. We introduced things to try to make sure people were connected like midweek meetups and more mentoring sessions one-on-one -on -one that really helped the veterans in our cohort um, continue to blossom during this really challenging time. From a personal perspective, you know, I'm looking at the, um, what's happening to businesses uh, nationwide during the pandemic and as a nonprofit, knowing that the support for some, some nonprofits that were not directly related to pandemic relief, meaning uh, jobs, um, shelter, food, that kind of thing, uh, we, were gonna, we were going to be um, set aside. Um, you know, those were not priorities. And while I think supporting small business is absolutely direct pandemic relief, not all of the previous funders um, saw it the same way. So I was concerned about the organization and about my, obviously my own personal um, entrepreneurial situation. So I looked around to see what was happening in the uh, environment around me and realized with lockdowns, that uh, people still needed financial documents signed, still needed to have refinances, which boomed during the pandemic because interest rates got so low. So I started a notary business and that notary business, not just um, self-sustaining, um, it was it's an exciting field. I love going out and helping people. Even though we were all in quarantine, it was an essential service. So I was able to see people every day um, throughout the entire lockdown. But more importantly, I was exposed to another group of people, very particularly military spouses, that were struggling to get their own notary business off the ground or were investigating it as a means to be self financially self-sufficient through all their PCS moves. So I started, um, I launched some notary business classes and they've been going strong and we're helping military spouses create businesses that they can take with them when they move from one state to the next with very little downtime. And so it's been... One of those lessons that we talk to entrepreneurs about that you have to look at challenges and, and find the opportunity within them. And you have to be ready to adjust and pivot when needed because it, without that kind of resiliency, then you're just gonna wither. And oftentimes when you're faced with something like this pandemic, your fear can overcome your ability some days to get to see the opportunity in that challenge. And that was where as, as from the Action Zones perspective, we kicked it into high gear to make sure that we were touching the people regularly so that we could keep them pumped and help them see those avenues that were opportunities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, we definitely saw that, um, you know, with your transition from, uh, you know, in-person classes to a virtual, completely virtual environment. And uh, also University of West Florida did that too. So we'll continue with you, Dr. Bachelor. Yeah, we started the end of last year offering our classes to veterans, and we have two cohorts. You know, we had one started end of last year, another one started a few weeks ago. But I think with us starting after the pandemic had been around for a while was, you know, a benefit. We didn't have to shift from one way of doing things to another. But I think, I mean, I always look at the positive side of things. I mean, it was great for us as far as being able to have a broader reach of veterans. People could make the meetings easier because. They did not have to all be in the same building. You know, they could log in virtually, being able to record videos and have people play them back later. Those are all things that really played in our favor. And as far as our, our speakers at networking events, you know, that was great because we could have anybody in the world, you know, because they could just log in. Um, so that's been good. And as far as recruiting entrepreneurs, um, I think the pandemic gave many of the people in our cohorts the, the time you know, the time at home to work on their business and start a business. So that, that was a definitely a plus for us there. Um, and other things that we're doing, just, you know, veterans are welcome to do this as well as anybody else at UWF and through our Center of Entrepreneurship, is we have a location independent entrepreneurship program that kicks off in um, August. August through January will be the kickoff. But we're looking at in Costa Rica, this university and another organization is helping people relocate that have put their businesses online to Costa Rica, where you can run your business anywhere. And it's just kind of a neat little thing. We're starting there, that location independent stuff where now the world has changed, you know, and then many people can run their business from anywhere. So why not do it on, you know, a beautiful country where you wake up every day, you know, with, with nice weather. So that, that's what we've been doing over the past few months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, when you, 
you both have done an amazing job and, and, and a support role for us at Veterans Florida and just seeing the results of the programs that you, that you execute. So uh, we appreciate that and we see it for sure. Um, Troy, would you like to continue? Sure. I mean, the first thing we had to do was really adjust our safety protocol. As I mentioned earlier, we service about 4,000 customers and do about 12,000 transactions a year. And about 70% of those are walk-in and pickup orders. And therefore we got a lot of customers that are used to coming in and out each day. And so we had to look and figure out how we were gonna plan and manage that business with you know, CDC protocols, which seemed like they were changing every day from the, uh, from the outset. And so this was a big shift because like I said, our customers used to walking in, sitting next to the salespeople, hanging out until they got serviced, um, talking to one another. And so we really had to take a look at how we manage that. You know, we, so we marked off spacing on the floor where people, you know, stood. We added signage. We put clear plastic dividers up, you know, at our counter. We had to have the proper PPE mask and hand sanitizers for not only our employees, but also our customers. So we went through a whole facility sanitiz sanitization schedule, you know, which was different. We're a metal service center. Our guys are used to being dirty and dirt everywhere. And so we had to go to this more hygienic environment. And so we put protocols in place to manage that work floor, workflow and, and help uh, our employees have safe distancing and talk to them. Here's how you interact with the customers from a distance. And you know, we had people monitoring, monitoring people coming in, how many people could come in, how much time out and we even scenario plan that if we weren't allowed to have anybody in the building at all, how we managed that. Fortunately, we'd never had to implement that. Um, and also we were fortunate that we were deemed an essential business just because of our product and customers being tied to, to critical manufacturing and the building supply chain. And so we were able to stay open to service our customers. Um, however, we didn't even know what our volume would look like. So secondly, we looked for ways to supplement the income. And, you know, unfortunately for us, masks being made out of metal aren't very practical. And uh, we couldn't make hand sanitizer like our brewery neighbor. So we looked at uh, creating some metal art uh, that we could sell online uh, because I just bought this $300,000 CNC plasma machine and I needed to make sure I was able to make payments on that. And uh, I, I think Rosie May, I was probably the, the last group uh, cohort that was in live um, sessions with Action Zone. And uh, towards the end of that is when all the buzz about um, uh, coronavirus was going around and you know, it was in Europe at the time and we didn't know what it would mean for us. Um, but through that course, one of the ideas and concept that I'd explored with the group that ranged from people that had idea stages um, to where maybe early in their business or a mature business like ours. Um, but we were all entrepreneurs together and able to share ideas. And so that's where this idea had, had uh, generated. And uh, just with people starting to move to Zoom calls and do that thing, it seemed like a really good fit for us. So, you know, we fast tracked that idea, you know, during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, Tom, you have a really interesting perspective on this panel since uh, you're in the restaurant business. So uh, you also had a lot of uh, new standards imposed upon you. So if you would kindly share your your insight with us. Yeah, I think the shock that a lot of people would have uh, is that the, the, the things that were you, you thought were going to be required, there was really no strict guidance. You know, uh, the, the health inspector showed up one day with mask and glove on. And uh, he said, I don't really know other than that, you know, the social distancing, you know, not, not being able to serve inside, but there wasn't as many rules and regulations as a lot of the folks in the public might think, you know, so my wife's a retired uh, chorus director and home ec teacher. And between that and my military experience, you know, we implemented a lot of things ourselves. It did, you know, this was St. Patrick's Day, the Friday after St. Patrick's Day is when restaurants were told, you know, lock it up, you know, and, and trying to figure out how you can support your employees, because that's what makes the restaurant, you know, the, the building is one thing and all the equipment, but seeing what we could do, because there was a lot of, it's like the hurricane, you know, 
how do you how do you prepare for it and then if it hits you what do you do afterwards so trying to figure out how we could sustain the employees you know um, and, and a lot of that was just, okay, we're, we have a plenty of food, you know, the freezers were full, the coolers were full. So, you know, we fed a lot of employees here, you know, show up on, you know, Thursday morning at 10 and pick up boxes and take them home, things like that. Financially, we've been in business 25 years. We've survived several hurricanes. I thought the BP oil spill and the economic downturn uh, you know, was a bad situation. You know, when we had the BP oil spill in Northwest Florida, that was a big deal. It, nothing compares to what we've experienced in the last year. I'm also in, in, in other, you know, in other hats that I wear, I'm the chairman of the Salvation Army here in Okaloosa and Walton counties. And I serve on Catholic Charities Board of Directors and the Catholic Charities supports from Tallahassee all the way to Pensacola, Florida. So, you know, we were able to use a lot of our facility here, you know, to help those organizations in, in feeding, uh, coordinating, you know, things that a restaurant has contacts with are beer companies that have big coolers, produce companies that have big coolers, the USDA, the truck started coming from USDA, uh, agriculture food, you know, available for, uh, you know, uh, emergency food distribution. So, you know, some of the things, you, you know, you, it's in the military, you know, you have many things under your hat that you may bring from civilian life or whatever, you know, reserve and guard folks have skills that may not match exactly the E5 that's the cook in the mess section. He may also be, you know, the deputy city manager of a town, at, you know, so some of those skills that, that I had in the military for organizing, you know, really came into play here. We've been very blessed. You know, we, we own the property. I'm, I'm, I know a lot of veteran groups or, you know, individuals that have businesses that, that rented space that, that didn't have that extra fallback money to pivot. You know, we were, we we're very lucky. We've been doing this a long time. And so having our own property, um, you know, made it sustainable that we were able to survive. We have survived. Uh, if you hear big thumps right now, I'm, I'm kind of out of the way because the, they're putting a new roof on. So to finish the pandemic, we also have Hurricane Sally that came through the area, you know, took the roof off the Salvation Army building, uh, damaged buildings that are Catholic charities and, and also got me a new roof here at the restaurant. So, you know, the, the, the gifts just keep on coming. <laughs> <laughs> well, Definitely, you've shared, all have shared stories of resilience and uh, you're all true survivors. So definitely an inspiration to our audience. Um, well, we'll just continue on uh, that topic of um, sustainability. So what are some valuable lessons learned um, from the past year that you all have, have um, experienced? So Rosie, we'll begin again with you. Um, well, the list is longer than my arm for sure. Um, as Floridians, I think, and Tom, you know, talked about this or hit on this is that, you know, we were always prepared for hurricanes. This was a completely different animal. And I think it has really it caused people to be invested in a plan if this something like this should ever happen again. And I, it wasn't on anyone's radar before. Um, I'm sure people were scrambling as Tom was, as Troy was to figure out um, what to do next. But I think one of the lessons learned is now we know that this kind of thing can happen here. You know, we're used to seeing it in other countries and seeing, you know, what's gonna happen does if once it leaves Europe. I think people are more cognizant of having um, emergency plans that they didn't have before. And to, to um, Dr. Bachelor's point, we also learned that people are accessible we might have been more resident, uh, reticent to reach out to somebody that we thought, oh, they'd never have time to talk to me. But we did during the pandemic because they were more accessible. And I think those are gonna, those kind of lessons will be valuable moving forward because now we know that everybody is just a Zoom call away. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You also made the point earlier of being able to pivot and being ready to go. So we, you know, this is, I guess, uh, we didn't expect it, but it was kind of like a, a warm up 
for uh, anything that could happen in the future. And, and pivoting doesn't mean just taking your idea and, and turning left or right. It might mean orchestrating an entirely new idea out of the ashes of what you've got left. Um, you know, Tom, you're absolutely right. People that were businesses that were renting their facilities um, were already under the eight ball um, if something catastrophic happened, whether it was a hurricane or a pandemic. Um, but they being seeing what they could do with what they had was really important. And I think what we saw, like what Troy did, he saw what he had, he was able to make art out of this and was able to move forward. It's just sometimes you need somebody behind you to say, I believe in you're going to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Bachelor, would you would you like to share some of your lessons learned? Yeah, well, um, see, see, for I, I had a different um, experience with COVID as far as what we're talking about with veterans and the rest of you, because we started all our programs during COVID, you mm -hmm. know, so everything was built online and, um, you know, everybody was hired online, people were recruited. And at that point, everyone was used to the new life of you know, working at home or doing everything from home on a Zoom meeting. So for us, the pivot's ahead. You see, it's the pivoting back is the big thing that I'm preparing for now. So, um, you know, just as, as an employer, my employees are used to working from home now. And, um, you know, I don't know how familiar everyone is with the university system and we're going back face to face in the fall. So having my employees switch back to face to face is the big challenge going forward that I'm facing right now. And some are fine with it, some very reluctant. And then for us, I, you know, I was listening to the restaurant talk about all they had to go through and, and the other business shifting from pre-COVID to the COVID restrictions. And I, and I was just hearing cost is what I was thinking, all the costs that you had to put through that and everything. But, you know, from my perspective, my costs went down on a whole lot of things, you know, cause paper is a huge expense, paper and printing. And it went from, I'm thinking, you know, $25,000 a year to almost zero. And now I'm about to be hit with all these expenses again. So my pivot's ahead, kind of how I see things. Um, and that's something you're not hearing a lot about yet is, you know, we talk about the pivot that's already happened, but what about the pivot that's coming and preparing for that? Right, right. And that, that leads us into uh, what you're experiencing, Troy, because you'll also have to, you're making that forward pivot with your company. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, everybody's using the word pivot and I'll continue to use it. I think it's an important thing. I'd also, you know, hit on what Tom said around just being resourceful and, you know, uh, and adapting and, and using the skills and talents that you have and the people that you have to, to kind of uh, work through the different challenges. And I, you know, I learned that uh, our people are a lot better than, than I thought they were in terms of getting through that challenge. Sometimes we have a fallback, you know, it's, it's, it's one of those things where it's business as usual until there's a crisis and that creates a solution and that becomes the new business as usual. And if you can skip that crisis part and just be able to create those new solutions and, um, you know, that involves for me, the lesson learned also scenario planning just for every possible challenge and what worst case, you know, prepare for the worst and, and hope for the best. And, and that's kind of how we've continued to move forward uh, and look at things. Mm -hmm. Tom, would you like to share some of your lessons learned? Yeah, well, I, I think what we're learning right now is maybe the, uh, the, the, the oncoming catastrophe is, and I've, I'm experiencing it with, you know, two not-for-profit organizations, and, you know, and my restaurant is, you know, with the not-for-profits, uh, gifts have never been better. People, people are generous. People have money. They have helped, you know, both, both the two charities that I work with very closely, um, good cash balances, fewer people coming to the door needing food, fewer people coming needing uh, assistance. Um, but here we are at the restaurant and I've had an ad running for several weeks for servers, folks to work in the kitchen. You know, we, we're a we're a small family restaurant and, and don't have a huge number of people, but I've had people move and go back to family up in Missouri. You know, a couple of good servers went back to family. We're having a horrible time, you know, along with a lot of other businesses like mine, trying to find enough folks to staff it. Um, you know, luckily we've had folks that have been with us for many years, 
but that's that's a uh, you know that that is the oncoming catastrophe that small business who do you hire you know what do you pay them uh and and how can you get them to stay uh the ford dealer here in town uh has been you know in for lunch he and his wife and and his mother and they run the ford dealership here for many years very successful uh he said he would pay $25 an hour cash money pay him pay somebody every hour just to help sweep the parking lot he said I, he has had zero applications you know i mean and that's kind of a, a you know an exaggeration of of what the but it is a real problem every whataburger every mcdonald's uh, we're a resort community and you know finding finding employees right now because people have received some rather generous gifts you know from the government and and i'm not sure how that's all going to work out but i i certainly have experienced it on the one side, you know, we're not having as many demands at Catholic Charities and at, at the Salvation Army. But on the other side, I can't, you know, I can't, you know, we, we interview somebody to be a server. Uh, they never come back. They never show up, you know. And, and so I think a lot of folks or business people are going, how do I do this? And when you, you know, you can only do so much where a few people can just hand, hand things through a window. We're a white tablecloth, fine dining kind of establishment people expect some service, you know, and people are coming back out once, once they've had their J and J or Pfizer or Moderna, you know, they've had, they've had their inoculations. They're, they're getting more comfortable coming out the age level that can afford, you know, my restaurant uh, they're coming back out. And, and I'm, I'm really stretched to, to be able to do the, the six days a week that we do. So oncoming challenges. Right. So uh, just, uh, I guess it, life is is never easy, right? <laughs> I mean, it just seems like uh, when you think you've got it all figured out, something else that uh, that presents itself. So uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, so that really leads us into the next uh, into the next topic, which is redefining what normal means. I mean, it's such a relative term. So moving forward, what do you consider to be a new normal for each of you in your industries? Can I, can I mention something? Absolutely. Um, and, and this goes back to both what Tom said and what Dr. Bachelor said. And, and, and to his point, people are starting to talk about these future pivots, um, but they're not, it's not gained the level of um, murmur on the national level that um, we heard the things at the front end. And a lot of it, as Tom pointed out too, is the generosity of the government making it more difficult to find employees. But our experience here in Tampa has been talking to business owners who successfully made a shift in their business to accommodate um, either remote services and product delivery or a hybrid model. And then coming about January or February, they could see that, okay, maybe we're gonna start coming out of this. And so now they have to make a new adjustment. And that is an adjustment to going back to the old way of doing business, which isn't going to work 100% of the time or creating a model that mixes what they've learned through the pandemic with the way they used to do business. And staffing is one of those big issues, not just that they can't find staff, but like Dr. Batchelor mentioned, people have now had a taste of working from home, as have businesses that can experience the cost savings of having employees at home. So the business, some businesses are going to be making adjustments that they didn't need people in the buildings, which is going to trickle down to real estate impact, commercial real estate impacts, because they found that they don't need to pay 10 or $15,000 a month for a class A office building when they now can orchestrate things from a different level. I think what we've seen with the pandemic that has affected business to this point is just the very tip of the iceberg. And the kind of adjustments that we're gonna be making moving forward are going to be staffing issues, um, real estate issues, um, physical office space issues. But the bottom line is we still have to reach our customers. So all of that has to go on in the background while we're still making money on the front end. Mm -hmm. and that's going to be tough. I think it's going to be tough for every industry. Yeah, but uh, it, it'll keep keep life interesting. So, uh, yeah. So uh, not like that. Yeah, yeah. So, so what? Is, I mean, let's maybe we could just kind of uh, explore this topic a little more. I mean, what all do you consider to be the new normal moving forward? What I'll, else? I'll... Sure. Well, I'll I'll. I'll... 
really piggyback on what Rosie and Tom talked about. And that's the people issue. That's my biggest challenge right now. I mean, uh, I'm the guy that's putting ads out right now, looking for three or four positions and we'll phone interview um, several people and about half of those won't even show up, you know, um, that was just a checkbox. And so it is a challenge with people. That's something um, that I'm, you know, really concerned about and keeping me up at night. Um, I think as far as the new normal, I mean, we've gotten used to the, the protocols of sanitizing and social distancing. Those things are like habit now. Um, and it's how we, you know, move forward with the business because now we've got some people that want to get vaccinated, some that don't. I'm going through a second wave of people having COVID in my business right now. And so, you know, we've been through that before, but some of them are, you know, uh, hey, I don't want to, I, I need to go home. I don't want to be here and how you work through that, you know, and dealing with the, the 70 customers that are coming in a day that need their stuff, you know, and you can't service them as quick um, as, as they need to. And so it's just really managing that customer service and that, um, you know, uh, balance with people. So it's a it's an ongoing challenge for somebody like me i mean and i see that being our our new normal until you know some of these you know stipends and stimulus things you know um change mm -hmm. a lot of people have more incentive to be home than you know uh coming into a business yeah it's interesting because in the beginning you know we talked about the fact that i think dr bachelor you made the point that it was a huge transition to go from in person to virtual um particularly with your employees <laughs> now we have to make that shift back and you know, think about all the uh, other other things in life that are impacted by that change so um yeah any other thoughts on that tom or yes John? well um you know, Veterans Florida, we would typically have in-person board meetings. Uh, instead of having virtual expos, we would actually have an in-person expo. The things that happen uh, because we have found a new way to do business, uh, we have, you know, we were challenged to, to not have a big expo where you, you rent the ballroom, you provide coffee and muffins for, you know, we, we're, we're supplying uh, funds to, uh, uh, have breakfast and that sort of thing for people that come to an expo. So the baker, you know, he doesn't have anything to do. The, the, the guy that owns that big hotel and the ballroom that has had multiple different kinds of meetings and expos and business connections, we found that we can, we can do it like a lot of churches are doing it. You know, we can do it with a guy on a screen in front of a camera. Uh, you know, we're doing Zoom meeting right here. It's not the most perfect way, but I'm in several organizations where we have more given more power probably to the executive director instead of having board meetings that go on for hours and hours uh, uh, in Panama City or Pensacola or someplace. Um, you know, we've, we've found that we can do business and board meetings have become shorter, uh, a little more to the point. Uh, so I, you know, I understand the business of, you know, the changes are in organizations of how we do business in, in not-for-profit organizations. Maybe you don't have to have the board go all the way to Tallahassee and lobby. Uh, you know, the state house is shut down. You know, did we get as did we get as much effectiveness out of the legislative process? I, I guess I don't know. Uh, you know, it, it's become more person to person with our members of the legislature to to talk to them, but not walk the halls. So, you know, it's a whole different world that's coming on. I'm, I'm, I'm getting up in years and I've gone to a lot of board meetings and, you know, pack that bag for an overnight thing to some town to, to be at a board meeting. I haven't had to do that. And I'm, and I'm not sure that the organizations are any worse for wear for some of that. So, you know, but the, but the businesses that supported those things, you know, the, the conference center here in our town, you know, it's, it's pretty much empty. Uh, you know, people have just stopped doing those sorts of things. A change of life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so, yes, yeah, so and that's uh, you bring up a really great point, Tom, because um, you know, change promotes rethinking your business plan and whatnot, reducing your expenses, becoming more creative, finding creative solutions. 
So if you would all um, share with us what kind of changes you've made in your physical and or digital environments in order to, um, to survive during the pandemic and then of course move forward and be sustainable in your business. Rosie, would you like to begin? Sure, I was just wondering how appropriate it is to say that one change is that my dog is always gonna to come to the office with me because <laughs> Is they are now just part of the part of the scenery of my business, um, and it, it's ironic that we're seeing psychologists come out to talk about the psychological impact of stopping work, the work from home thing and moving back to the office, and the pros and cons of that. You know, for us, it was um, at, at first it was like every shiny object. You know, we, we were used to Zoom in March of 2020. We had used Zoom before, not extensively. Uh, then through the first and second quarter of the year, it was like there's Zoom and then there's this one and there's this one and this. And every time somebody else brought a new toy to, to play with on the screen, it was like, well, will that help us better? Will that help us do this better? Is there something about that one? Um, so I think the changes to our environment basically have been that we are completely comfortable now, totally digital on Zoom and have actually made our services more efficient as a result um, and, and had the, the time and the ability to document those processes so that we can be more efficient moving forward. Um, to the case of how things are gonna continue to change as things open up, we are hoping that having the time to do that now with the processes and the procedures and the way things flow in the company that that will make us make any future changes easier to adapt to because we've already got the foundation of some things which as a three-year-old nonprofit you know that was one of those wish list items let's get all this down documented and ready to go but who had the time so the pandemic gave us that time to help really formalize the organization better and structure um, the process so that we could serve the veterans um, in the program better. And from the notary side, the same thing. Um, Dr. Bachelor, trust me, I have consumed your paper budget over the pandemic with the number of people that have refinanced their loans with these low interest rates. So the paper mills are still even with all the what we've been doing. But so that's kind of what we've done, just adapted to the digital and made the processes more efficient for us so we can serve better. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about things, you know, yes, like the dog, you know, our dogs have become such an important part of our daily life and also things like uh, curbside pickup. I don't know <laughs> how we're going to live yeah. with that in the future if it goes away. Hopefully some of those things will, will stay. So um, yeah, um, would any of the, the other panelists like to share some of their uh, changes or thoughts about that? Well, I'm happy to share kind of where we're at from our physical change. Like I said, you know, we kind of had to restructure our workflow and that's continued. That's kind of become the new normal. Um, it also made us really advance what we're doing digitally in terms of our online presence. Um, our website is, has always been focused on um, SEO and, and um, you know, driving to get new customers, but really not so much selling. And so we've kind of trailblazed a little bit within the metal industry of being able to sell metal online. Um, not a lot of our competitors, and, you know, I mean, the metal industry is one of the biggest global industries and there's only a handful of companies that sell it online because that's not the traditional way to sell it. So, you know, during this pandemic, we created a web store and enhanced that. We're continuing to make enhancements on it. Um, I created a website to sell the metal art um, that came out of, um, the entrepreneurial program that we did uh, at Action Zone. And so uh, just, you know, knowing that more people are looking online uh, because they are at home or because it's easier, it's at their fingertips, you know, and you got a, a whole new generation, you know, coming of age that they know no other way but to look through um, their phone. And so I know that I've got to do that because the welders that, you know, when I came to this business seven years ago, are now either retiring or getting out of it, you know, um, and a new group is cropping up. And so we gotta be able to, to make sure we have a platform that, that engages them and, and we're touching them. So social media is a, is a big thing. You never thought like a, a metal company targeting a bunch of welders 
would have social media, uh, but it's a big part of what we do, you know, blogging and all those kind of things. So we really have changed our, you know, digital environment just to create more um, Im imprints with the customers, um, but also uh, an other way to make it easier to do business with. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've, we've got some, this is Tom. Go ahead, Tom. Yes, we uh, hear you. All right. We have a, a committee here in our community that uh, sponsored and built a bell tower in the local cemetery. We have about 1,700 veterans that are laid to rest there. And for years, it's been the site of the Memorial Day and Veterans Day ceremonies. And the, the, as soon as the pandemic came, you know, we, we wanted to continue having the ceremonies, but of course, to be able to have the, the general from Eglin come down or, or the AFSOC commander or, you know, somebody from the Ranger camp or the Navy EOD school to be your speakers, uh, we went to, uh, you know, a local, local individual who does uh, video, videography. And so we live streamed it on Facebook and it was such a success that, you know, instead of having 300 people at the cemetery, we had about 20 people, you know, the, the, the primaries, the, the flags, you know, the change of, you know, the change of the colors and all that sort of thing. But more people viewed it than we had ever had at the cemetery itself and people all over the country and all over the world, you know, it live streamed. And so within a day or two, you know, the, the hits were just amazing to us. So, you know, while we never did it before and it was a little costly to, to approach it from the first time, we've continued to do it for the, you know, we'll, we'll be doing it Memorial Day again, and we did it for Veterans Day. Um, it, it's a new way to do business and it's something we will continue to do. We had never, we never needed to do it before, but because of the pandemic, you know, we actually have more veterans and more families and more gold star mothers and, and spouses, you know, watching this ceremony uh, than we've ever had attend in person. So, you know, there are some things like this. Uh, uh, the young folks are very used to, you know, uh, new churches that, that open up, you know, have a screen, maybe have a pastor in one town and are servicing two or three communities. Um, I, think, I think a lot of us, less old folks like me, we're catching up, you know, we're figuring out, you know, this is a good way to do business. So there's a lot of things like that, I think, that are gonna come out of this that are, have been very positive in our community. That, you know, they asked me, are we going to do it again on, on live stream? And I can have the general from the Association for the United States Army in D.C. online to speak to a group that's in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, watched by people all over the world. You know, it, it's you know, we finally accepted a lot of this that, that that if it hadn't been for the pandemic, we probably wouldn't have been as deep into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really ironic because. The more we're socially distanced, the closer it almost brings us because we can, it's every, like you said, Rosie, we're more, you know, people are more accessible almost because we don't have to be physically together anymore to share ideas and collaborate. So, uh, Dr. Bachelor, um, I know you're thinking about paper and the <laughs> expenses behind uh, how things are going to change for you. So we're going to yeah. need all the new school buildings. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, yeah. I'm, 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 Touching that one because that's a that's a, a topic that um you know it's a little bit of a hot button you know we have all these but we're very heavy on buildings you know <laughs> in the university system and I, I'm not going to say anything one way or another about that but um but one of the things that that I'm facing is you know is before you could require people to come to work or do whatever come to class but now we have fear of getting sick as an excuse not to do anything, you know what I mean? And is that good or bad, I'm not taking a side on that, but that's an acceptable excuse for not attending or not coming to something. So that that is a change in how to deal with that from employees, customers, students, whatever perspective. If someone cancels an appointment because they're afraid they might get sick for going to it, well, what are you gonna do? You know, that that's just shifted. That's been a shift there. And, um, you know, I hear this from entrepreneurs and then, you know, I'm in the, I guess, in between the public private sector there with what I do, but we've lost a lot of autonomy on how we run our business, you know, or our businesses. And I hear you guys say in that it's more compliance. How can I comply with the government regulations and still try to stay in business or, or stay afloat? 
you know, so that has been a shift, um, having to, to, to go from, you know, the profit seeking to compliance and survival. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Well, I think, uh, we've been able to cover uh, lots of great, interesting topics and provide some super insight for our audience. Are there uh, any, any thoughts or anything that any of you want to share as we uh, wrap up today? Well, we want to thank you for hosting us today and, and putting all this together. And, you know, the virtual expo is where it's at today. Hopefully we will have some mix in the future, but thank you for, for your efforts on this. I know the board of directors of the Veterans Florida, you know, we're, we're a new group, but uh, we're certainly accessible and want to help, you know, and, and veterans, veterans moving forward into, into the business world. If I'd have had a Veterans Florida organization when I opened the restaurant, it would have taken me, you know, a lot less time to figure out what the heck I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's uh, that's definitely music to our ears. So uh, thank you for that, Tom. Um, yeah, I think we all do what we do because um, we see the results and it's uh, very meaningful and beneficial. So I appreciate all of you and your time and your insight. So thank you to all of you. And I uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. So thanks again.